calls and says, Dick Gregory is going to be at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. I bought two tickets, invited a friend of mine, and we went. I, I took him a little bag. It had a, a Michigan apple and an organic orange, and it had a, a DVD of a storytelling performance, and it had uh, an inv a thank you card thanking him for his service to America, to the country, to the world. In, in every area, health, all kind of health, laughter, everything. And I had in a little yellow bag, and I gave it to him before the show. And then after the show, he was taking pictures with everyone. And uh, he took a picture with me, and I said, please don't throw that bag away. And then Mark Sweetman said, did, well, did, do you want his booking agent's number? And I said, yeah. And so he got it. And I, and I just let the number just sit there for two months. I was, I was afraid to call. It's like, this is too, we're too little. He's not going to come here. And then I did this seminar called Causing the Miraculous. And the homework assignment was push past where you normally stop. And I was stopped from calling him. And I was right in front of Goodwell's, you know, getting, getting ready to get my pocket pita crack sandwich. And that's when I took out my phone. Boom, 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 boom. Hello? And I, and I made the connection. And then somehow through some kind of miracle, he said yes. And then not only that, not only that, he's just generous. He's just generous with his time, with the interviews, with everything. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let me read his bio. I mean, this is his bio, but I was just telling you, I moved. <sighs> Richard Claxton Dick Gregory has lived a life far from ordinary. He is listed on Comedy Central's top 100 stand-up comedians of all time, and in the 1960s helped bridge African-American comedy to Caucasian audiences with much success. After the 1998 birthday commemoration for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., then US President Bill Clinton said, I love Dick Gregory. He is one of the funniest people on the planet. Dick Gregory began performing comedy while in the US Army in the mid-1950s. Through the use of irony and satire, he held up a lens to American society and its racial stereotypes, using comedy and social action to address injustice and discrimination in American society. A performance in 1961 at the Chicago Playboy Club launched his national reputation within a year he played out to sold out audiences in nightclubs and became a popular television comedian. Dick Gregory is best described as an African-American satirist, civil rights soldier, author, nutritionist, presidential and mayoral candidate. His wit, spontaneous, spontaneity and fearlessness gave him the skill to knock down the doors of racism, intolerance and corruption for over six decades. A close friend of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Mager Edwards, Gregory was politically engaged to, agree to, to, to a degree no comedian has ever been before or since. Gregory was a regular on the front lines of Birmingham and Selma, where he was jailed, beaten, blackballed, and forever changed. For the rest of the 60s, he channeled his political and social passions into devastating satire about racism, politics, Vietnam, and much more. Though he broke the color line for African-American comics in clubs and on TV, and paved the way for countless comedians who followed, many younger Americans today know his, him best as the inventor of the Bahamian diet. Gregory is the author of Nigger, published in 1963 as his first autobiography. The book was a bestseller and has since sold more than seven million copies. He published a second autobiography, Callous on My Soul, in 1998. Dick Gregory's career has spanned half a century. And even tonight, we have comedians in the audience that uphold his legacy. And we have Terry Hodges here tonight. He's, he, you're opening for Chris Tucker tomorrow night. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, keep it going. Keep your hands going. Please stand for Mr. Dick Gregory.
me say thank you. I thank and praise God that we have all made it here safely. And I pray to God that your return and my return will be equally as safe. Let me first say thanks to the, the people who put this together. See, I don't have nothing. I just have to produce a body. <laughs> I don't have to move a mic, move a chair, move a nothing. Hmm? So for those of you that's responsible for this, we say thank you. Secondly, let me say thanks for the invisible people that make this happen. The people at the airport, the people that came and met me. If you've ever been to an airport on a rainy, snowy day and the planes are canceled, you ever had that happen? And the next thing you know is two o'clock in the morning, and they ran out of all the lies. <laughs> so now they got to put you in a hotel. Hmm? And as you leave the airport, all the restaurants is no food. The men's room and the ladies' room is filthy. No toilet paper, no paper to wipe your hands. This is four o'clock in the morning. You go to the hotel, you got to be back up at five. You go back to the airport, hear me good. Oh, the men's rooms and ladies' room is spotless cleaned. The paper that wasn't there is there. All the cooks are back, and anything you want, they have. These are the invisible people that we don't give a damn about. <laughs> You leave here, when them spaceships leave here, going up, they got to go through tens of billions of clouds and other stuff that's there we can't even pronounce to get there. And unbeknown to you, after we leave here tonight, somebody will come in here and clean up behind us. We will never know their name. That's what America is about. A bunch of trifling nonsense. <laughs> the sad part about it is you don't know it. Bad part. When you were born, the universe gave you a vibration that nobody can trick you. Huh? Nobody can trick you at all. And so I've listened to, thank you. And I'm saying to you now, there will come a day when we took off in comedy, there were no comedy clubs, huh? None at all. There was no place you could train or get the feeling of it. You, you want to play music, there's a school you can go to, whatever you wanted to do except comedy. And I sit, it's the first time I've been in one of these places. I sit here and I realize there will come a day when people just coming up talking about their experience. See, it's one thing you read what the New York Times says about me or the Washington Post, what all they buy is. It's another thing when you hear me stand here and talk, <laughs> not being interpreted by anyone. And you need to do this at home. Huh? Stop being all serious when you get home. <laughs> Especially you black folks. You've been in some old white racist job. Most of you didn't even know it was like that. And you want to come home and you want to be a man. They call you everything but a man. And you say to your son, God damn, bomb your daddy. I'll kill you, nigga. This is my house. Oh, you're not mad at me. You're mad at them white folks that all you did was smile. <laughs> It's a game they play. Hmm? Your father, hmm? 
Watch everybody came there. That means he was a trifling nigga when he was young. Hmm? And think everybody else come to get his daughter be like him. That's what it's about. See, you all the folks think y'all got wisdom. You ain't got a damn thing. How you got wisdom when a cop can shoot your son in the back of the head and you don't do nothing about it, huh? How you got some kind of wisdom when you go to war for the same country that enslaved you and then bring Korean Germans over here and they, did y'all see the story two weeks ago where they found out it was hundreds of Germans thought getting social, social security? Okay? And you black folk just sit around like you a wimp on a log. Huh? And so you got the quiet, quiet, that's what we're talking about, quiet, quiet your spirit. So you can hear the real God, not the church. Hmm? The real God. Now let me say something. I'll be saying something about white folks tonight, and you white folks don't get uncomfortable. I will not be talking about you. <laughs> See, I've advocated for years since I've had some sense. White ain't a color, it's an attitude. And if you don't have trillions of dollars in the bank, you can't have the attitude. <laughs> so if I ever took over, I'd make all you black folks apologize to white folks, but you mad at the wrong white folks. The white folks you mad at couldn't help you if they liked you. <laughs> See how it works? And some of you white folks, y'all need to get you some real Negro friends. <laughs> Some young ones, they ain't gonna lie to you. Hmm? White men, this might be the first time you heard this. Do you think we'll ever get damn sick and tired of you walking up to us with three and four PhDs, mansions we live in that's bigger than your whole community? and look at me and say, you stand out of trouble? Boy, your mama stand out of trouble. Huh? Now think about this. You women don't hear it. Huh? I don't care how much money you make, how much you got in the bank. Most of them white folk walk up there, or you stand out of trouble. Hmm? And nobody's ever stopped to say, wait, hold on. I was at a, a LaGuardia, I guess the airport, about, oh, 20 years ago, and I see this white lady and this little girl, couldn't be no more than five years old, they looking at me. So children are honest. She walked to me and said, uh, excuse me, your name Dick Gregory? I said, yep. He said, uh, my mama said, you got a tail. <laughs> you know how stupid and ungodly you got to be to be mad at a five-year-old child when it come from her mama? So I said, yeah, tell her I've got a tail, but tell her mine's in the front. I was looking at all that snow out there in Buffalo, New York. <laughs> Buffalo, New York. They talk about more that the football game got to be canceled than the 10 people that died. And the people that's trapped in the house. Hmm? That's the America we live in. And y'all can play all your games. There is a universal God, not the Catholic Church or the Baptist Church that put the whole planet together. And let me hip some of you old folks that need to be hip. There are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on planet Earth. That's who made you. Citizen Roe didn't make you. Citizen Roebuck didn't give you nappy. God gave you nappy hair. And you the only woman on the planet that wear all kind of wigs, all kind of cover, and you don't know something's wrong with you. They got you believing you ugly. It ain't about ugly. It's about beauty. 
they have you locked up on glamour. Hmm? Glamour. It's a big difference between glamour and God's beauty. Hmm? Somewhere. I married a little old country girl. Smart. I met at the University of Chicago. Well, she met me. Oh, they just loved her. Oh, she worked for the top people that have messed this world up. <laughs> right? That's who she worked for. She didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> Schultz, Dr. Stigler, huh? The night, the statistics that they use now come from Dr. Stigler. They go all over the world. They had to call Lillian. Uh, what do I have to do to that? What do I have to do to that? Hmm? So then when Stigler published his first book, he called the house and said, uh, uh, I sent a copy of the book you get. He said, yeah, it said to Lillian Gregory, the real author of this book. I said, come on, man, you bullshit. She ain't wrote nothing. She organized your work. Then when he gets a Nobel Prize for it, he calls the house and said, uh, they're going to let you and your wife to, to come to Oslo. And, uh, and no, 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 you did that. No. I barely know how to spell statistics. <laughs> but whatever they are, I didn't tell him this, they got to be messed up. Because hmm? nothing came out of the University of Chicago that was good. <laughs> so game. So uh, these little children, listen to your children now. Because they be saying all kinds of things about your dumb ass. <laughs> and the reason they won't say it to you, they know you so ignorant and messed up, you would hit them. <laughs> I'm when I was nine years old, my mother said something I didn't like, and I called her a real dirty name, bitch. He said, what'd you call me? I said, I called you a bitch. How old am I? Nine years old. Where'd you hear that? I hear daddy call you that all the time. You ain't never chastise him. <laughs> this is a game. And one day, when the real stuff come down, y'all think y'all gonna make it somewhere special? You ain't going nowhere special. There's a real God that says to you, nigga, I made you. Not the Ku Klux Klan. And if you think I'm going to sit by and let you reduce yourself below the dignity that I gave you just so you can feed your family and pay your rent, I'll destroy you from the inside. That's the real God talking. Huh? That's no Klaner. You ever dawn on you the same God that created the Ku Klux Klan and the slave owner also created you? Are you, are, are you aware that the same God created the Germans Created the Jews. Now, if you can't figure that out, you're in trouble. Huh? And maybe through a set like this, where you can come and hear the talking word and then go home and put your family together and do the talking word and make somebody else the hero other than some jive entertainers or athletes. That's the biggest game of bullshit in the world. I know you all. There's people sitting in this room now that have done more for the humanities than 98% of all the athletes and entertainers put together. <laughs> this is a game they play. I called Bill Cosby. They said, man, I've never been to law school. I sure would like to be your lawyer. <laughs> No, did you see what that white woman two days ago said? He carried me to his house and gave me some wine and gave me this pill. What trifling hoe is you gonna take a pill? Huh? That's somebody you don't know and swallow it? And you gonna come to me with some acrylic dinner? It might have happened, but what you telling me? I have no respect for that, and I'm a father with seven daughters. Huh? But you took a pill from a stranger? Huh? And then wonder what happened? <laughs> Why don't y'all be laughing? Y'all done done something, it just wasn't a pill. You, have you ever woke up the next day and say, I wonder what got into me last night? <laughs> I did.
So we'll fast forward, my, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Michelle. <laughs> Them niggas scare me. They don't even talk black. Dot. <laughs> he said, mother told me to find out if you had some time that I could do an interview with you. Yeah, she said, well, we, we're doing an interview on uh, the family, whole class. And you could do it on one or two things, the family, or you could do it on the astronauts. So I said, you want to do it on the family? Okay, she gets a little note. She's six years old, you know. Uh, Dad, how did you propose to mother? I said, Michelle, me and her got married on February the 2nd, and you was born March the 28th. <laughs> now, you've been with me. You know all my children are bright because I didn't mess with them. Huh? She said, oh, I think I'll do it on the astronauts. All my children is bright because I told them education ain't nothing. Huh? Nothing. All the folks you read about in the Bible, wasn't no schools then. Huh? The Egyptians that built the pyramid, wasn't no schools then. What kind of fools are y'all? Napoleon had the greatest army at the time in the history of the planet. And he went to Napoleon, where them niggas don't even make matches. <laughs> and beat up his whole army. Took their stuff, they didn't use, they threw an ocean. And then the real people came in. Hmm? The real ones. Cause he thought he ran the country. The real white boys came in and said, <clears throat> he said, let me explain to you. No, you can't explain to me what happened. Let's get out of here and go home. We got the scientists in here. Hmm? So they went back and Napoleon said, <clears throat> what happened? He said, voodoo. <laughs> so you know why you're laughing? Because they tricked us all and make us believe voodoo is something. Voodoo in French is a French word, spiritual Adam. You can't see, neither one of them would translate to Uncle Tom. Hmm? Y'all can play all your games about Uncle Tom if you want. But one day you better figure it out. A tomboy is a tough girl. A tomcat's a tough girl. When it come my turn, this thug that made it weak and y'all buy that. Uh, Uncle Tom is a shapeshifter. <coughs> okay. But here's this white boy and come over here. And you listen to it. I mean... The one clue she, you should have jumped off on, Columbus didn't discover America. The boy got lost. <laughs> I was born on October the 12th. I've done more to discover America than he did. <laughs> I think he did. So when you stop and think about it, Columbus, you don't need to go to Harvard. Oh, you got to ask is how can you discover a country that's already occupied? <laughs> and if you buy that, I can walk out here tonight and discover your car with you sitting in it on the parking lot. <laughs> you say, get out this car, I've discovered it. <laughs> Sit in the back seat and teach me Thanksgiving. Universal God is not in the business of making fine booties or fine lands. George Washington wasn't beating up the British for the right to open up a college, for the right to be free. The song don't say give me education or give me death, they give me liberty or give me death. For well, all you black folks sitting here think you free, you ain't free. Huh? You have never been liberated.